And now, dear Lord, by the words you've given your servant, we pray that your spirit would come unto us and open our eyes to see that this truth concealed within thy word would be revealed, Lord. Bless us now, dear Lord, we pray. And just as you did at Galilee, do it unto us as we break the bread of your word found in Isaiah. We pray. Amen. What a blessed uh, time to be together and uh, the hymns that we just sang unto the Lord. You'll notice that we read from Isaiah 58 today, and uh, today we will take a short break from our Synoptic Gospel series to honor a subject matter that I believe is long overdue and is just rightful for us to learn about and teach. And it's necessary to be heard of all of, of, all of us as the Lord continually reforms each and every one of us individually and then as a whole, as a corporate body. And so over the next couple of Lord's Days, or in the next number of Lord's Days, I wouldn't say couple because I can't promise it's just a couple, but over the next number of Lord's Days, I intend to teach you on the subject of the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. What should we think about the Lord's Day? How did we get to this point in our time and age where churches practice what we call Sunday worship? or the Lord's Day worship. We have a sort of routine. We can call them ceremonial or a ceremonial element within our gatherings. But what are the principles that frame the way we view the Lord's Day, if there are any today in our modern churches? What does the scripture have to t say about our observance of this day? Why Sunday? When you go into the Old Testament, there wasn't this practice of Sunday, but dominantly a practice of a seventh day, which is the Saturday. Why is it Sunday in the New Testament, and how do we get there? Remarkably, in the history of the church, almost all Christians throughout all, almost all times, when you read church history, have agreed, and, and this is remarkable, I think, because in, all, in everything, in uh, all the differences and debates of the churches all over the world in all times of history, we can all agree in one thing. And that is, or at least uh, when I'm speaking of conservative Protestants or even non-conservative Protestants, and when I'm speaking out, I'm speaking that narrowly now, not to Protestants uh, that uh, teach heresy. I'm speaking of Protestants that believe in faith in Christ and not in, in traditions stuck up on like uh, what you read uh, the Pharisees doing. Uh, true churches. And in all of history, almost in all of history, you'll read almost all churches agreed that Sunday was the day of the Lord. It was the Lord's day in which they were to worship. And you might even ask, we meet every Sunday and you wonder why. Why Sunday? And why do we do the things we do uh, liturgically? Why do we sing the hymns? Uh, why do we read the scripture the way we do? Why on this day? Now, some of the very earliest post-New Testament records by our church fathers tell us that Christians worshiped on a Sunday. In AD 107, Ignatius wrote this piece. He said, those then who lived by ancient practices arrived at a new hope, and those he's referring to Jews. And I want you to consider as well that in the period of time, before we get to our present day, you have several periods of time in differences in attitudes towards how the Lord's day should be viewed. And I want you to consider that in the early church father period, there was this debate and contention or con uh, contending of the faith against this fresh um, and um, aggressive, um, you could say, neo-Judaism uh, of that day, which tried to bind Christians, just like Paul in his confrontation of these uh, these Jews who came to Galatia, uh, who tries to bind Christians to more traditions and practices. Or you just have the regular Jew who is going to synagogue on Saturday. So the early church fathers in the, in the first or second century were really uh, fighting and defending, and they had such great hatred for anybody who tried to connect uh, the fourth commandment and bind that 
to the New Testament Lord's Day practice. And so it seemed like when you were reading the early church fathers that they didn't agree that the fourth commandment applied to the New Testament, or sorry, to the New Covenant Church in regards to the Lord's Day. But really their main concern was, the reason why they spoke this way is because they didn't want to give any leverage nor hint to any Jew that they wanted traditions continuing or they wanted any holidays, mosaic holidays and traditions binding the, the New Testament church because that's what they were freed from. And so Ignatius writes that these, these people in ancient practices arrived at a new hope. They ceased to keep the Jewish Sabbath and live by the Lord's Day on which our life as well as their shone forth thanks to him and his death, though some deny this. In the Didache in AD 100, this is uh, earlier in the writings of the Didache, uh, the Christian principles believed in reading this. It says, on every Lord's day, his special day come together and break bread and give thanks. First confessing your sins so that your sacrifice may be pure. And another thing to note down is when they comfortably use the term Lord's Day, that is with the assumption already given in Scripture that this is referring to the first day of the week being Sunday. In AD 131, Barnabas, in the letter of Barnabas, we keep the first day with joyfulness, the day also on which Jesus rose again from the dead. And when he had manifested himself, he ascended into the heavens. Um, in other writings or in other renderings of it, he calls this the eighth day. I don't know how Barnabas saw it at an eighth day. Um, but the reason is because th some of them were numbering weeks out of ten days rather than seven. Uh, so this is why he would call it the eighth day. Just for our familiarity uh, and our knowledge, he was referring to the first day, which is Sunday. We keep this day with joyfulness because Christ rose again. And he manifested himself and ascended to the heavens. The Roman philosopher Pliny, he's not a church father, but he is a philosopher who wrote about and observed the Christian practice. And Pliny wrote in AD 112 that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before sunrise and reciting an antiphonal hymn to Christ as God and binding themselves with an oath not to commit any crime but to abstain from all acts of theft, robbery, and adultery, from breaches of faith, from denying a trust when called upon to honor it. Now remember, Pliny is not saved. Pliny is just giving what he sees. And Pliny is uh, not, uh, though he may seem like he's implying, uh, maybe that is what he's implying. He's implying that on Sundays was when they didn't do crime and that it was okay to do it on other days. That's, that's not the Christian doctrine. But that's what he observed they were doing, that they were abstaining from all worldly things and sinful actions. And in, in general, he says, denying a trust when called upon to honor it. In other words, they had cer certain commitments on the Lord's day that they weren't to abandon. After this, they went on. It was their custom to separate and then meet again to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind, similar to what you see when Paul speaks of on the first day of the week that they broke bread and they communed, and he says food of an ordinary and innocent kind. And I don't take this lightly or neglect that part of the writing because you'll realize in, in uh, Paul's writings uh, to the church in Romans that the pagans had feasts and they ate all sorts of foods and uh, indulged in all sorts of gluttony. And on the other hand, you have the Jews who were stuck up on eating a certain way. And so why Romans 14 was written was to sort of teach them, or not sort of, but really to teach them what it meant to love one another, not to stumble each other. And so this observance of an ordinary and innocent kind meant there was control in their dinner. There was control in their eating together. So it was even a practice that the church met twice. They first came to the, the church uh, services. Then they went uh, separated and then they came back to dine together. Philip Schaff, who's known to write great works regarding church history, writes this in sum of a, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the solid fact that uh, the Lord's Day was settled by apostolic authority. And this is what he says. The celebration of the Lord's Day in memory of the resurrection of Christ dates undoubtedly from the apostolic age. Nothing short of apostolic president can account for the universal religious observance in the churches of the second century. 
There is no dissenting voice. This custom is confirmed by the testimonies of the earliest post-apostolic writers as Barnabas, Ignatius, and Justin Martyr. It is also confirmed by the younger Pliny, and that's the one we just read about. The Didache calls the first day the Lord's Day of the Lord. And why it's amazing is that early on in church history, you see this pattern started by the apostles in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this pattern has, been always, been the case, has always been the case throughout all of history, whether it be the church, early church father period, to the latter of the church father period, to the medieval days, to Thomas Aquinas, to the Reform Reformation in Luther and Calvin, and to our present day. There was, there was no uh, sort of argument that the church uh, wasn't to meet on Sunday or the first day of the week, but they did this as a common practice. Now, I'm pointing this to you to see the unity that comes out of apostolic authority. I'm not trying to say that it is because the church fathers practice this way that brings leverage to our practice on Sundays. But the point is, is this is the pattern set in Scripture that the church throughout history had taken. In similar questions to what we've just heard about the church fathers, we have to ask, why then did they do this regularly? Was it a changeable custom uh, that uh, they could sort of play around with the days and play around with the ways that they um, practice ceremonially? And was it a requirement from God in Scripture, or was it a requirement from God through the apostles that they would uh, practice the Lord's Day. Another thing is, there's this perception that when it comes to the Lord's Day, it's an entire new uh, uh, day in which the principles of it are only found in the New Testament. That the principles of what is done on the Lord's Day cannot be found in the Old Testament. And there are a group of people today which stand as the great minority against all uh, of those who have taught throughout history that teach that there is a new way of viewing church. There's a new way of viewing church meetings. There's a new way of viewing bindings of the principles of Christ. And that uh, we can't look at the Old Testament to sort of frame our thought of the uh, church meetings. And so that makes us even ask further questions which I would desire to press upon us as we move further, as you'll then learn as covenantalists how we should read the scriptures. And I would say now that it depends upon where we believe um, the rest day or the holy day of God originates. We could even call this the Sabbath known in the Old Testament. There is a teaching that now because we are in the new covenant, the principles of Sabbath do not apply to our Lord's day. Is that true? Is it at all related that this Lord's Day, is it at all related to the fourth commandment of Exodus 20? If Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments are considered moral obligations, and Christ upholds them in the Gospels, is the fourth commandment an exception? And does that just fall, and now we only have nine? Or does the fourth commandment, as we assume every commandment of the ten, still applies today? How does that one apply to the church on the Lord's day? Could it be that it is out of this moral obligation where the church found it fitting to observe the Lord's day from the principles of the Old Testament? Is there a relation between the Lord's day of the Christians and the Sabbath of the Jews? Is there a relation at all? Or do we just entirely do away with that? These are all challenging questions that we are going to be dealing with, and they concern historical issues, theological issues, practical issues, and biblical issues. They concern it all. What happened in history? What happened, or what does it say theologically when God reveals his word? And depending upon how we define these theological uh, teachings is how we practice. And so that involves us. That involves our worship, how we for, uh, order ourselves, shape our thinking when it comes to worship of the Lord. And, of course, what the scriptures as a whole says. Shall we look at scripture broken? Shall we look at it inconsistently? 
Or shall we look at it in the unity of God's word? As in our confession of faith, it also says this. That the interpretation of scripture cannot be one verse on top of everything of the scripture. But the scripture shall be interpreted based upon everything around the passage of scripture for further interpretation and understanding. In other words, if there is a passage of scripture that is clear on one thing, we cannot take that passage and dump it on, on top of every other passage and neglect everything else. But we must see that scripture passage and see its consistency with everything that God has spoken in scripture that we may further solidify our, our, our beliefs and our confession. And so our obligation in regards to the Lord's Day can confuse some because the subject of the Lord's Day uh, brings a lot of questions such as what to do, what not to do. And so it's a, a confronting matter. It's a, a plethora of confusion for many, uh, whether it was uh, dealing with details of uh, uh, debatable and ethical issues. They think that when we speak of the Lord's Day that uh, that's our concern. But I would argue that from the beginning, even in the Mosaic institution of the, of the Sabbath, the binding of the Ten Commandments were not at all, even the introduction to the Sabbath was not at all burdensome. If anything, the, burdens, uh, the burden came from the Pharisees who further bound uh, the people of God. They made a fence around the Sabbath. And so when you read the, uh, the five books of the law, when God gives a Sabbath, he just says rest. And if you were told to rest, I'm sure that's something you'd love to do. And so it's nothing binding at all. And really the only thing close to binding on the Sabbath was what? Well, don't start a fire on the Sabbath. That was it. Everything else was created by men to add and create a fence. And so when people think of the Sabbath, they think of such a burden um, or a binding law. But the purpose of it, and I argue as well as what Christ says in Mark chapter 2, that the Sabbath, uh, or the Sabbath was given for man and not man created for the Sabbath. Just as man was created on the sixth day, and the Lord blessed the seventh on the seventh day, so the man first created gifted this rest, and, and not the other way around. We are not created so that we can serve a day, I would argue. And so the whole point is that God gives, whether it be the Lord's Day of the Christians or the Sabbath of the Old Testament, the day was meant to be a gift to the people of God so that they can honor God in their, uh, in their week. So it's not about a mountain of confusing details or debatable or ethical issues, uh, difficult issues, but I would like to remind us that our duty in simply learning this is to merely understand how to keep the Lord's day holy. That's it. My goal is not to bind you. My goal is not to at all uh, make you antinomian because you can fall in either side. And when I say antinomian, no law. You can either become hyper-sabbatical where you bind the necks of everyone like Acts 15 and Galatians 4.10 or you can be antinomian where you don't believe in a law, just like the Gentiles once did. So you can fall under the Pharisee tradition or the pagan tradition, one way or the other. And we know that although God's truth has overruled every opinion of man, it certainly still is a polemical topic. And when I say that, it's a controversial subject matter. And that's why today you have people arguing, what should we do on the Lord's Day? What should we practice on the Lord's Day? Is the Lord's Day a matter of doing this, a matter of doing that? Is the Lord's Day about refraining from certain things? Is the Lord's Day about do's and don'ts? We must remember the essence and the spirit of the law. I think our, our learning of the Gospels really prepare us for a teaching like this because we realize that at every principle and command of God um, to be instructed to do something and to refrain from something the essence of that is a heart unto the Lord it is to love God it is out of love for the Lord 
So regardless, you're going to realize that the scripture commands you to do stuff, right? And like I said in Exodus 20, it's not as though that at Sinai, the Jews were crying to the Lord, Oh, Lord, this is so difficult. No, they found joy in the words at Sinai because God was speaking to them. He was giving them commands and none of them found that burdensome. And so the same way as Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do we cry legalism when he says that? Absolutely not. So regardless, we are going to find out that God tells us of things to do and the things not to do. And we should not cry out uh, legalism because we know that legalism is that works of man that pushes it forward above faith. And that that is their way of pleasing God by keeping traditions and holidays. But that's not so when it comes to faith or the people of faith. Though they are instructed to do a certain thing, there's something that transcends that, and that is their love and faith for God. And out of their love and faith for God, they then obey Him. That's what we just read in our confession of faith. They have the free will to now obey God and to live for Him. They don't consider it a burden. And so this is why I must teach this, because a lack of care concerning this subject, and when I say a lack of care, is that uh, a lack of care in the sense that I don't teach it. If I don't teach it, there's going to be issues. And if I teach it uh, uh, falsely, there's going to be uh, terrible results among the church, among us. And a lack of care concerning the subject can either lead us to miss or depreciate aspects of truth that seem unfavorable to us. And um, when something is unfavorable to us, we oftentimes just dismiss it. But what if the scripture teaches us something that we should actually be doing that we aren't even aware of? We should be uh, awakened to those things. Or it may lead us to adopt legalistic views of Sabbath, keeping uh, in distaste for libertinism. And libertinism is... When people want to live freely like the pagans where there's no, not, there's nothing binding them. You see, the argument Paul has with the Galatian church and the book in the church to the, Rome, uh, to the Roman church, he argues that now that we are in Christ, even to the church of Corinth, actually more to Corinth, two epistles to them telling them of this, he says now that we're in Christ, we should further live in holiness and not uh, as though we are acting like because we are free, we're free from any sort of commandment. And that's what the Corinthians were doing and the Galatians were doing. And he says, do not use, to the Galatians, do not use this grace as for the occasion for your flesh. Because some of them thought that now that we're free, uh, hints of Romans 6, that now that we're free, we can sin, we can do whatever. Again, antinomianism. And so we can hate legalism so much, uh, we can hate the hyper Sabbatarians or those who hold onto a holy day tradition, um, mosaic holidays and whatever. We can have distaste for it so much that we become antinomian. We can lead that, lean that way. And so um, we have to consider these things and I hope at the end we would see its practical importance as we order our lives in obedience to Christ. Dr. Sam Waldron says this in our approach, and this is a hermeneutic in our approach to the scriptures. If we are to understand God and what he wants us to know, we must in our hearts view it this way. If we are ever to come to knowledge of truth in our studies of the scriptures, we must approach them as sons. Otherwise, it is altogether too impossible that our lot will be that of those professing Christians of which Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.7 who are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Matter of fact, he elaborates further and he says we must approach the hearing of God's word like sons and not defense attorneys. But pastor, we need to be Bereans. Absolutely you do. But upon hearing God's word, you are sons. 
Bereans were sons in the sense that they studied not as defense attorneys, but they studied because they wanted to know what Christian life and worship was all about. And they wanted to ensure what they were feeding off of was that which will pull them and drag them to an increase of love for God, not to become defense attorneys. And that's sometimes what we become, even under the preaching of God's word. Not sons, but defense attorneys, where we're ready to question every single statement, not that it's wrong, but be skeptical, even if it's all in the scripture, in truth. So we must approach it as sons, otherwise you will end up just like those people that Paul was rebuking, always learning, but never ever coming to the truth. And so we have to consider that. And I think as a good introduction to learning about the Lord's Day, we need to understand our attitude. Our attitude toward the Lord's Day, but most importantly, our attitude toward the Lord of the day. And without understanding that, you won't even consider the Lord's Day. You might just think that when we speak of Lord's Day, that pastor is trying to bind you with a day. That pastor is creating a holy day. Not at all. We must understand our attitude toward God. And when we understand God, then we could realize in fullness what actually belongs to him. If the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it, then he has every right, the creator of heaven and the earth, to ordain and establish a system of worship in which the, his people should follow and obey. Even Adam in his free rest in God, and we could say eternal peace with God prior to the fall, Adam had principles. Adam had an order in which he had to conduct himself. He had a commandment not to eat of that tree. There were regulations. And if God is sovereign then he has every right to ordain and establish an order of worship in which his people should follow and pattern themselves to. It does not free them from that very order and structure of God from the beginning. Is this making sense? And one of the major changes in the life of the church over the last century, I say the last century because it is true, It's remarkable because from the church father's period up till the last century, we see such consistency in observance to the Lord's day. But over the last century into our very own century today, there has been a great change of attitude towards Sunday worship. Too much for me to even talk about. Let me go on further. In Canada in 1906, a law known as the Federal Lord's Day Act, believe it, there was an act, a federal one, called the Lord's Day Act. In 1906, made it an offense to transact business on Sunday in Canada. Commerce, buying, selling, retails, closed. Malls, restaurants, closed. Sunday, everyone was at home. People were in honor of God. Canada was under the influence of England, the Puritans of England. And the king and what he passed on would then be brought forth because Canada, as you know, even in our current prime minister, Canada likes copying what other nations are doing. But in those days, they were copying well the things of God as they were getting their teachings from the men of England who were also being counseled by men of God. And they passed such legislation in the 17th century under King Charles I. And this day, of the Federal Lord's Day Act, which the Puritans called um, the market day for the soul. It was the day in which everybody rested, not in the sense of complacency and laxity, but rested from working in, uh, in, in, in relation to the world. I mean, they're... Uh, making a living or whatever it may be, Um, if they didn't need to, that is. And uh, they were then to work and focus 
toward God. That meant going to church, that meant fellowship, that meant evangelism, that meant going to the sick, visiting the poor, and or whatever it is, doing good. And so Canada adopted that in 1906. And malls, grocery stores, all places of commerce were closed. And spaces of recreation, such as parks, beaches, and all of that stuff, were limited in access. In other words, not every single place of recreation was open for you to go like we have today. And so not only in Canada, but similarly and widely most known, this is called the Blue Law, right? Blue Laws. And um, it's known uh, even in Asia, actually, who also have influence, received influence from North America, also observed in some ways. And so a typical Sunday for almost all Protestants in North America and in England was what? Number one, early in the morning they would wake up and go to Sunday school. Sunday school to many of us is for children, but Sunday school according to the church of old is a, is a time where the families were taught the catechism and the confessions of faith and the things found in scripture. So they woke up early in the morning and they went to their local church. By the way, even before... Um, cars, uh, at least the, um, the ability for people to purchase cars at ease, people attended their corner local church. And so the morning was they'd go to Sunday school, and, and this is also keep in mind, this is not re Dutch Reformed people. It didn't matter if you were a Methodist or a Dutch Reformed person. In the nation, they were practically observing in the same way, although there may be differences in the way they teach and practice, whatever. But this is just how it looked like. Sunday school, secondly, after Sunday school, they would go to church morning service, which would probably last a couple of hours. Third, after that, just as what was observed by Pliny is also being done, they would go home and separate and you will have various testimonies of history written down that when mothers and fathers and children went back home, they went home and they sung hymns unto the Lord. Not only did they sing hymns, but they also devoted in Bible study. The father sat down with his children and his wife and he taught them the scriptures on the Lord's day. If they didn't do that, what they, what they also did as a common practice was they either went out for lunch, or not went out for lunch because things were closed, but they went home, they invited them home, the brethren home, sorry, brothers and sisters home, and they had fellowship. That was a common practice. After the morning service, they invited brothers and sisters. That was a time to practice fellowship, to break bread, to thank the Lord for what they've just heard. And then after that, in the evening, they would all go back to the church and they would praise the Lord and follow the principle of Psalm 92 where in the morning we are fed and in the evening we sing your praises. And so this was a normal practice just about a, a hundred years ago. You see how far we've come? We've come so far. Up until 1985, the Supreme Court, as we become more liberal in thinking, as we become more anti-Christ, as we become more anti-God. Now, uh, again, the law didn't say that those, uh, those things of necessity, for example, hospitals or whatever, commerce, anything that man would sort of indulge in that would take them away from the practice of the Lord, uh, that, that was shut down. But in 1985... The Supreme Court of Canada struck down the Lord's Day Act on the grounds that it binds all to a sectarian Christian ideal. So the government said, we don't want to be bound by Christian doctrine. Because that's what it once was. The Lord's Day Act works as a form of coercion inimical to the dignity of all non-Christians. In other words, it forced people to observe Christian practices. If they weren't church people, they just stayed home. But you can tell the non-church people were rioting within because they didn't want to just rest. They wanted to go to the beaches. They wanted to buy. They wanted to do all sorts of things. And the Supreme Court says it takes religious values rooted in Christian morality and using the force of the state translates them into a positive law binding on Christians and non-Christians alike. Now, 
when the Supreme Court struck that in 1985, immediately. Now, you'll also notice in our nation that they didn't immediately open everything at once because people were still on the edge. They were still fighting their traditions. They were still wondering whether or not this was right. And so you'll notice throughout the period of our nation, they ended up opening them in certain different times and years. However, this gave malls, grocery stores, and all places of commerce the right to open seven days a week out of economic pressures. Problems in the economy, this would push commerce to be available seven days a week to gain sales and to live with the standards of the economy. Ever since that period of time, statistically, the true hearts of the church, now statistically the true hearts of the church, uh, statistically you'll notice the decline in attendance which reveals the true hearts of the church attendees. The attendance dropped because recreational uh, areas were open, malls were open, grocery stores were open. And, and uh, if grocery stores were open before the act was shut down, only a certain part of the grocery store was actually available for you to shop in, by the way. And so it revealed the true hearts of the people attending. You could say it's a blessing in disguise because it revealed the apostates. It revealed those who weren't really saved because they ditched church gatherings so quick for the malls. Eventually, as culture changes the way people think about religion, specifically to the Protestant frame of Canada and North America, and even in England, greatly in England, you notice that other days have now become the priority. Today, you walk into a church and it is natural for the Christian family to consider Sunday to be a family day. Not that it wasn't. It, was, it is intended to be that anyway. But it was intended that that family day would be unto the Lord. But when I say family day, it's not the definition I just said. It's family day as in we do what we want to do. Or, believe it or not, you might find this funny, but it truly was a debate in the United States of America. When the National Football League began to increase in fans and the teams began to become more uh, competitive and, and uh, they were gaining more traction in business, there were politicians that actually said this statement. They said, there will never be a Sunday where, the, uh, the, where American citizens will not go to church because of the NFL. Today, evangelicals in the United States will schedule their services at halftime of the Super Bowl. Just so that the true religion of America, which is really to watch football, would be allowed for them. And so it became NFL Day. And far from their minds was the honor of the Lord's Day. We've gone so far. And not only do we notice the change in culture, but I've already stated the impacts, its negative impacts to the church. Because culture has shifted, the way the people in the church uh, view culture and their uh, uh, freedoms have also changed. And because there is a dropping number within the attendance of the body of Christ, what has happened in our local churches? This resulted in churches and pastors forced to close their evening services. They had problems because that evening service that used to be packed is now empty. And now the elders are coming and they're caving into culture and the elders are now saying, what should we do? And so they just chose to close the evening service. Whether they were renting or they owned the building, it just was not practical because if the people aren't there, the people aren't giving, the people aren't supporting the, uh, spiritually and financially, it just wasn't practical. By the way, the Council of Dort, remember this, they were confronted with the question even in those days, 
in the 17th century. What happens if people are complaining about the evening service? What happens if they don't want to come to the evening service? And the council at Dort said in response, if the people of God do not want to come to the evening service, then let it be. But may it be so that the pastor and his family are the only ones left, even if it means they are the only ones left, let it continue. Well, those, that statement is not considered today, is it? Just close it. Not only is the evening service closed, but church in, in general is closed. Churches that did well in the past are no longer to be heard from. Pastoral resignations has been a great thing. I've met up with a couple of um, individuals that have given me insight of what's happening through the nation of Canada, uh, through our nation, in our denomination. And a lot of elder pastors, older pastors, have resigned from the pulpit because no young people to be found. The, the older folks, the seniors, which should have been the primary example to the young, are no longer coming to church. And so this turned away the young people. And that's why you walk into these old-looking buildings on the Lord's Day and you find that it's empty. Even the congregation before us in this facility, they needed to open it up to other people because it's dying out. And over the last couple of weeks, I've heard that pastors are getting discouraged, pastors are giving up, and statistic shows us that the age range of pastors who are dropping out and resigning are pastors from the ages of 30 to 45. Not 80 or 70, but 30 to 45. These are young ministers that should be continuing the preaching of the gospel. Now the debate is whether or not they were truly called as pastors, but the point is, you cannot neglect the fact that even those called to ministry get discouraged. And so pastors resign, and what does this leave it open to? Greater apostasy, the propagation of a dumbed-down, non-authoritative gospel. And what do people hear behind the pulpits today? That the Lord's Day is not that important, even if they don't state that. It's just from the teachings that imply to the flock that the Lord's Day isn't holy unto God. That the scripture isn't important. That the hymns aren't important. Bible studies aren't important. Prayer meetings aren't important. And now everyone has come up with an antinomian mentality when it comes to their worship of God. I will only come when I want to. And this is a great offense to the Lord. The truth is today we have such a different attitude of how we view the Lord's Day, not entirely because of culture. And we can't blame culture for it. Do you want to know why we have a different attitude in the body of Christ when it comes to the Lord's Day? It's because we've become more tolerant to our idols. We blame culture for the change of heart of the local body. No, blame the church because it's become more tolerant to its own idols. We've accepted that if culture is doing it, then perhaps we could also do it too. Today, evangelicals view the Lord's Day as sitting through a two-hour sermon. Listen, a two-hour sermon, if you are lucky, and it's usually hard to find a place that will teach you for two hours. By the way, the Puritans taught for four to five hours. In Paul's day, the scripture tells us that he preached so long that the guy fell because he fell asleep at how long the sermon was or the teaching was. Long. Two hours today is nothing compared to before. And today, it'll be rare for you to find a church that'll teach you for two hours. I remember I was invited to a church to preach and they didn't tell me the time limit. I didn't know that that's the type of Baptist they were. And I was there 
30 minutes in, I wasn't even done my introduction, and there the pastor was in front of me looking at his time. And you know, the zealous me of that day rebuked him right there in that (laughs) pulpit. I said, God and his word needs more time. He talked to me after the service. He says, I was expecting you to preach for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So then commonly when people attend church, it's for 15 minutes sermons. <laughs> and then afterward, their mentality is after we've gone through the service, we can just go back to our worldly affairs. And then they fully dismiss what it really means to call this the Lord's Day. Has it ever dawned to you? We message each other in the morning and we say, Happy Lord's Day. But is it really true that we have kept the Lord's Day? Or have we profaned the Lord's Day because of our non-binding mentality? In addition... A great mistake over the last 40 years was the application that pastors need to shorten their time for evangelism. There was a great commotion in church history that there were people that were saying to their pastor, teach shorter so that we can evangelize. And so what did the pastors do? They caved in. They shortened their sermons. And at the result of shortening their sermons, what happened? The church shrunk when you shorter time in the Lord's Day services, you also will, that will equal or uh, that will result in biblical illiteracy, right? You shorten the time of the people's meeting, you also dumb them down. And so what evangelism is there to do? If these people aren't equipped, if they're poor in their biblical knowledge, what evangelism is there? What mission is there to do? I believe and I argue that the true evangelism and the true heart for missions and the reason why we have the gifts that we do in 1 Corinthians 12 are found because the church gathered, met, were discipled, exposed sins, exercised those gifts with one another, and then out to the world, just as the disciples were with Christ for three and a half years, and then unto the entire world they went. But evangelicalism has turned the other way. Shorten our meeting times so we can do more for the Lord outside. Absolutely false when it comes to the order of God. This is why churches are closing down. Today you can think of a great church that um, has many people. You think of Grace Church. You think of churches that are large that teach orthodoxy. Could you imagine a time period where all of North America was like that. Today, you can only name one, two, or three because the truth is, there aren't many. And so it's almost like in the public arena, the conservative Protestant churches of North America have disappeared. They used to be dominant. They used to be there, but now they're gone. Where are they? They're hiding in the closets. And the ones who come out the closets are those liberals who have now taught a new gospel that the nation is now worshiping and obeying. They came out the closet, the evangelicals went in. And certainly Sunday gatherings have now become a burden. Have you felt that way after Pastor John has gone through two hours, 30 minutes of teaching? You feel like, man, when can we finish? It became a burden to many of us, to many people, rather than a delight. What if I told you that the Lord's Day was given to you and I as a gift? It's a gift. It's not to be deemed as a burden. If Christ has saved us with his word, we just sang it. You broke the bread of life. You shared it to me, thy words of truth, which has given me life. And now break it unto me again that I may see by your spirit that I may see it in life. That's the whole point. God has ordained that he would give us a day so we can delight. We can rejoice. We can gather. There is a parable called the parable of the park. 
And you might be saying, Pastor, when are you going to get to Isaiah 58? I'm not done my introduction. I'm not done my rant, sorry. <laughs> Isaiah, oh, sorry, Isaiah. The parable of the park. There's a parable of the park. And there's this parable that I'd like to, to, to share with you because it's going to impact the way we view Isaiah 58. The parable of the park teaches what? There's a king who created this park. Grass is amazing. Trees are as healthy. Flowers are blooming. And in the middle of that park is an amphitheater where the king met, uh, met with his uh, designate rulers and his followers. And the king often met with these people at the amphitheater to teach them, to lead them. But the king in his duties had to leave. And so he left his designates to maintain the park and to make sure the citizens were coming and meeting at the amphitheater regularly. But as the king left, a few months came by and the leaders became negligent of the park. So what had happened was the grass started to die, the trees started to die, the flowers started to die, and nobody was cleaning up in the park. And now the citizens didn't want to enter the park because they said it was disgusting, it was ugly, it's corrupt. And then eventually there comes the rulers again, or these designate rulers, and they saw, wow, what has happened here? And so they desired to restore the park. So they, again, planted new flowers. They ensured they took in, uh, taking care of the grass and the trees and everything. They cleaned up at the amphitheater. But what they did was they feared that the, the park was going to be dirtied again. It was going to die again. So what they did was they regularly maintained it. However, they built a fence around the park. And so instead of the citizens going into the park, the citizens are now looking through the fence and not enjoying the, the beauties of the park. One day, the, the king's son came to the park and he saw the fence and he called upon those designate rulers and he said what? Shut down the fence, or sorry, uh, take down the fences. He says, did you not know that my father built this park so the people can come and enjoy it, delight in it? But you have built a fence so that they are no longer able to come and enjoy it. They're restricted. So they said, sorry, fine. And, and the, son, the king's son left and the designate rulers were given the task again. He appointed new men this time. And so they kept it at a good state for a while, and then eventually they neglected it again. Until it is fully destroyed, the park is gone again. Sooner or later, you have these new developers that come to the property and say, Hey, why don't we just get rid of the park as a whole and build buildings here? Why don't we just do whatever we want in this park? Why don't we just get rid of it, do whatever we want with this property? And then you have another group of people fighting saying, no, 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 we need to restore it the way that the king said it should be. And then another group of people said, yeah, let's restore it. However, we need to build the fence again. Now, Pastor, why do you keep talking about this park? What is that? What is it really trying to illustrate? The king is referring to God. The park refers to his day. The people and rulers in respect to Israel or the church. The fence is restrictions and bindings unnecessarily to enjoy the delights of the Lord given to his body. And the destruction of it is the negligence of man with delighting in the Lord. And so in greater detail, those people arguing what to do at the end there, are Sabbatarians or anti-Sabbatarians. And a Sabbatarian is a man who believes in keeping a holy day unto the Lord. An anti-Sabbatarian is the developer who comes in and says, let's just tear away with the park and do whatever we want with it. Where you have the legalists who say, yeah, let's re recover it, but then let's put a fence around it. Do you get my point? And so today, we have those people at the park, the anti sabbatarians the Sabbatarians, and they're fighting. What are they fighting about? How should we worship God on the Lord's Day? 
That's the argument. What should we think of Sunday? Antinomians say what? We can do whatever we want. Legalists say you have to do this. And uh, even further binding, which is really choking people. And you have those in the middle, which we as covenantalists represent. We are those people who are learning of this word today because we represent those people who enter the park and say, what has happened? We need to recover the intentions of the king for his day. We need to recover the purposes of God when it comes to his delights. When the king was originally meeting with his people at the amphitheater. What was the intention? And so the question we should ask is, what should we think of Sunday? Should we think of Sunday partially or should it be entirely into the Lord? A person with the attitude that says, I don't think we need to give the entire Sunday to God, is a person with the attitude that, dis that, that totally disregards the fact that the day belongs to God. Think about that. Somebody who says, this is too much. Um, when, when someone screams like that about church, right? When they cry and say, it's too much, too much church, Pastor, you have too much activities. Is that really the statements that a believer should be saying out of their lips? It's another way of saying, that's too much worship for me. Right? Someone who doesn't think that the day belongs to the Lord, or sorry, that be believes that the day isn't holy, to be practiced unto the Lord is someone who doesn't believe it belongs to God. This is why J.C. Ryle says, The man who finds them a burden and not a privilege may be sure that his heart stands in need of a mighty change. Immediately what comes to my mind is John 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless his heart is first change of God unto the Lord and understanding the delight of God for that man. Remember Mark 2. The Sabbath was for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a gift for you to delight in the Lord. Whether it be in the Old Testament context or the New Testament Lord's Day, it didn't matter. It's irrefutable. The Lord desires that we would receive this gift and delight in Him. But only the unregenerate would not delight. And so as I said earlier, before we can consider the day, we should consider the Lord of the day. And only then will we acknowledge what belongs to him. Now let me be quiet. Let's go to Isaiah 58. Now in this chapter, we see the lifeless formalism in the worship of God's people. False religion, dead religion. That's what you see. Prophet Isaiah rebukes these people in the first verse where he's told by God, Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression to the house of Jacob, their sins. God commands Isaiah, rebuke and expose the sins of my people. Why? Because they were practicing religious things with sin in their hearts. Does this remind you of something? Matthew 5 to 7, right? Pharisees practicing certain things, but their hearts were full of wickedness. Well, that's the same voice here in Isaiah 58. Look at in verse 1 and 2, or verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. What's happening? In verse 1, they're full of sins. And yet even in their sins, they confidently seek Yahweh, thinking that Yahweh is pleased with them. They're so deceived that they're confident in coming to God, thinking that God will hear them. And God even explains here that they come to me as though that they were people that did righteousness. What else is mentioned? They are a people that forsook the judgment of their God. 
and they're people that don't delight to draw near to God. They're not concerned about true religion. That's what verse 1 and 2 is talking about. The attitude toward the Lord. So what's happening in Isaiah 58? He's talking about false fasting and false Sabbath. And we know that these are practices of worship given in the Old Testament. And so was God focused about being consistent with fasting? Was he, consist, uh, was he focused about being consistent with Sabbath? No. God wasn't, consistent, or wasn't concerned about the punctuality when it came to Sabbath or fasting. Just as he is not concerned about keeping days. The Lord isn't concerned about keeping a certain day. For example, Sunday. That's the day that we uh, view and as, as a day unto the Lord. And hence, because it's a Sunday, that's my rationale for worship. You see, the reason why it's our regular habit to meet on the Lord's Day is because of our attitude toward the Lord of the day. It didn't matter if we met as the people of our brothers and sisters in Saudi who meet underground on Wednesdays as their Lord's Day, they meet there. And they do because of their honor of the Lord and that day. But regularly in the New Testament, we see they met at the first day of the week. And do you think it was because, oh, well, it's a Sunday, there you go. No, because it was that pattern given to them out of their love for their Lord. They kept that habitually. Paul rebukes anybody who thinks of days in Colossians 2. He says, we're not to be judged by days. So we don't worship because of days. We worship because of the Lord of the day. Yes? And so that's the point. Isaiah 58 isn't about just fasting and about Sabbaths. It's about keeping a true heart unto God. These people were fasting. These people were keeping Sabbath, but they weren't keeping their hearts. Just like people can be punctual in their attendance, but their heart's not there. Just like what Jesus says in Matthew 7, they profess me, but their hearts are far from me. Right? They, are, they weren't there. I never knew you, he says. If we look at verse 3 and 4. Why have we fasted and you see it not? God is questioning, what's the purpose of the fast? Why was it ordained? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours, like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. They fasted, but they didn't see its purpose. What was the purpose of fasting? It was a gift to practice fasting because it was a time to humble themselves unto God just like our prayer today we consider prayer a gift because it's a moment where we can have access to God and talk to him and humble ourselves just like that with fasting it was a moment where they abstained from food and they focused on the Lord and they asked of God in humility but instead instead of humility being their fruit it became uh, about being arrogant and proud and fighting with one another. So they were fasting, but the result of their fasting wasn't the purpose of fasting. Um, they were fighting, and, and it says here that because of this contrary attitude, their voices were not, were not heard. They will not be heard. Look at in verse 5. Is, it, is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? In other words, isn't this the reason why I chose the fast, so you can humble yourself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, and a day acceptable to the Lord? And there you go. It's given as a gift. I gave it so you can be humbled. I gave it so you can bow down. I, I gave it so that you would uh, be acceptable unto me. Yet you dishonored it. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? And this is amazing. Who quotes this passage? The Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't he? Gives us even further understanding of this text. When it comes to the true fasting, 
true Sabbath. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer you, shall cry and he, he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in the scorched places and make your bones strong and you, all, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. Almost all commentators I know on the book of Isaiah take this passage and read John 14 and chapter 15 into it. They read it because this is the true purpose of fasting. This is the true purpose of religious practice. It is so that we could be gracious, that we could experience the mercies of God, that we could receive the blessings of God and see it in its fullness in, in our obedience. And that was the true purpose of its practice, to loose the bonds, to let the oppressed go free, to feed the hungry, and there's promises from verse 8 to 12. You will be strengthened. Do you get the pattern here? Obedience and delight to the Lord will result in spiritual blessedness. And even in this context, temporarily, their blessings with their victory over their enemies and, 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 and everything they needed in, uh, in, in the land, God provided that. In a, in a, on a physical measure but this from Isaiah 53 throughout speaks into the messianic uh, point direction and yes it may have benefited the people of Israel in that day it pointed also to the coming redeemer who would make this all more realized look at verse 13 if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it and not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly. Then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. And I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Look. They not only profaned the fast but they profaned the Sabbath. How did they profane the Sabbath? By doing their own pleasures. And listen, in Revelation 1.10, John says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And recognize where John's alluding his reference, the Lord's day, here in Isaiah 58. My Sabbath, my holy day. Yes? The days in which is meant for the Lord or ordained for the Lord are called the Lord's day. My holy day. And they profaned his holy day. By doing their own things. And he says if you honor it. Meaning that it implies that they weren't honoring it. They were dishonoring it. They were seeking their own pleasure. And instead of talking those words of edification. Those words of, of the goodness of God. They talked idly. They spoke vain things. This is why the Puritans said on the Lord's day. You should didn't even talk about your bills or your concerns. Your anxieties. You've had enough of work. Don't use the Lord's Day to talk garbage. That's how strict they were. Which is true. Because Jesus says you'll be, you'll be judged anyway. It didn't matter what day it was. And so they didn't want to observe the Sabbath with pure hearts. But one thing we do recognize is that despite their profanity, their profaning of the Sabbath and the fast, what does God say? What does God do? He reasons with his people. 
he reasons with his people. Despite your profanity, if you would turn back, if you would recover, if you would step into my ways. And not only that, you see, to us, when someone wrongs us, you're done. But the Lord reasons and even says, if you rectify this, I will, I will promise to bless you. Beautiful. If they would only delight and honor him, he promises their blessings and exaltation. In two ways. Look at this in verse uh, 13. Sorry, 14. Then you shall take delight in the Lord. What does that mean? It's a promise of having true unsurpassed fellowship with God. He's saying if you observe and have true delight in me, then you will have such an unsurpassed, joyous fellowship, communion with me. Amazing. The whole point of the Sabbath was that man one day would recognize in his rest the beauty of his God. That's why Mark 2 is emphasized. And so he's, he promises you will delight in the Lord, and that means an exquisite pleasure. This is being overwhelmed, consumed by the glory of God. Listen, guys, I will say this now. Your view of the Lord's day is going to impact how you read the book of Psalms. It will. Do you realize when the psalmist calls the people to worship, it was always at the holy gathering of his people. And when he says, come and make a joyful noise, come enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise him with a high sounding cymbal. When he's calling these people in many of the psalms, it was always in reference to the time that they gathered. Well, no wonder why we have these principles in our practices of the Lord's day. Because it's seen throughout of the Psalms. And what were the psalmists singing when they said, Come, come and observe of his wondrous deeds. Come and see the glories of our mighty God, of our high fortress in our defense. It was always about the attributes of God. That's what the Psalms speak of. The whole point of the Sabbath was that people would delight in the beauty of their God and they would then be ushered and called by their God and say, Come, enjoy my attributes, enjoy, enjoy my beauty and my glory. Rest from the world, rest from the, the businesses that you have that take you away from me. But take this day, be with the people of God, observe my ways and my glories. Take it, it's a gift for you, not a burden. This is why the Psalms are so beautiful. You'll read them, and I promise you, you will not see them the same again. You will look into that, and you will see the depth of our command from day to day to our corporate functions. It is a delight promised in Isaiah 58 that is in the Song of Solomon, and many of us don't like reading it because it's about this romance, but Song of Solomon speaks to us of Christ and his love for his bride. And in Song of Solomon 4, it says, Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. The groom says to his wife, Come, enjoy, take of the beauties of the garden. And then in Song of Solomon 5, the bride says, oh, my, my husband, beautiful hair, beautiful eyes, beautiful lips, beautiful from head to toe. That's the same delight the bride of Christ has when they speak of their Lord. How good is he? His mercy is grace. And when they gather, they have something to sing about. They have something to preach. It's because they've been overwhelmed. Not because they kept Sabbaths and fasts but because they kept in their hearts the Lord of the Sabbath and the Lord of the fast and the Lord of the day. This is why they have that promise of delight. But that is not temporarily or temporary. This is referring to this fulfillment further in Christ. Now take your Bibles and uh, pastor is, is on, on a roll here. <laughs> Are you still with me? Psalm 95. To have the delight of the Lord 
is the cry of Psalm 95. The word of God says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his, are, are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Now listen, you might be reading there like, oh wow, they're talking about God and his work in creation. Well, I would argue that this is the same principle that God gave to Adam and Eve when he rested on the seventh day. He blessed it, he declared it, and all of humanity and everything created acknowledged the beauty of their God. And no wonder why in the Psalms, when they came to rest and when they came to sing, they always sung about the Lord who created all things. The Lord who from nothing made everything. Because that was the original intention. Verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Now listen. If you're familiar with Psalm 95, you'll realize that the first few verses up to verse 7b, the latter of 7, is praise, 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 praise. But suddenly... There is a call, a warning. When we read this, you're going to be reminded of a passage in the New Testament that will help you further understand the intent of Sabbath, the intent of rest, the intent of the shadow, and the beauty of the substance. I'm gonna, look at this. Let's read this together. Verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. What is the rest? Well, to them at that moment, it was really what Psalm 95, 1 to 7 was referring to. Joy in the Lord. But there's a warning. If you don't hear his voice, if you don't hear his voice, you will not enter that rest. Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Great parallel. Now I really need to hurry because the Tagalog church is not going to like me still being here. <laughs> well, let's practice patience, I guess. <laughs> Hebrews 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than house, the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence in our boasting and our hope. What am I pointing out here? As covenantalists, people who believe that God is consistent from point A to Z, that God from the beginning is the same, and the principles that he lays out are but shadows of the grand picture that he is about to reveal. This here shows us that though Moses was given these principles, there was something that he was shadowing which would come after him, which in Deuteronomy, the greater prophet unto Moses, which is Christ. And yes, Moses was great, and yes, everything that he established was great, but it was Christ that he was pointing to. Another emphasis, keep your finger there at Hebrews, because we're going to keep reading that, but I just want to add this thought in your mind, is Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 17. 
He's speaking of festivals and new moons and Sabbaths. And in verse 17, he says, These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now go back to Hebrews 3. What I'm trying to say is that there are ordinances in the Old Testament that shadow the substance, which all of it reflect Christ. That is irrefutable. We can't argue about that. Both dispensationalists and covenant theologians all agree that everything in the Old Testament reflects of what is going to happen in the New. It is progressively working its way to Christ eventually. The only difference is that we do not see breaks in them. We see continuity. We see that the Lord from the beginning is progressively working his way to Christ. For example, circumcision was a shadow which would pro obviously the substance in Christ would be salvation, but circumcision into the New Testament is now what? Water baptism for those who come to faith. The Passover was a shadow, and in the New Testament, it was the Lord's Supper. And then what? It is a practice of communion, which the substance is in Christ. Does that make sense? The Sabbath then, I would argue, is also a shadow, as we've already read, as rest. In Isaiah 58, though it was in a seventh-day ceremonial observance, the principle of the Sabbath is carried on unto the Lord's day. So the idea, which we will unfold further in the next number of weeks, which I'll give you specifics. I know it sounds very general right now, but we'll go over that together. But I argue that the shadow of the Sabbath in its substance is Christ. And I, I, and, and I need to keep reading Hebrews 3 to 4 because then you're going to get my point. But remember Psalm 95. Therefore, as the Holy Scriptures, verse 7, says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if we indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, those bo whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? You see, the good news was already preached to the people of the Old Testament. And that was, at their practicing of the Sabbath and the fasting, it would shadow the substance in Christ. But what did they do? Psalm 95 shows this. Isaiah 58 tells us that. They disobeyed God even after hearing the good news. And so now the author of Hebrews uses that same argument. And he warns the people of his day. And he says, many of you are going back to traditions. If you have heard the good news, remind yourself that if you heard it, then take care and consider it deeply in your hearts. Chapter 4, therefore, while the promises of entering his rest still stands, look at that, despite their disobedience to the Lord's commands, God says the rest still stands. Salvation, hope in Christ is still available. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundations of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Look at that. So in verse 3, his works were finished, Right? And in verse 5, they are not to enter his rest. In verse 6, it remains for them to enter. But those who formerly received the good news failed to enter. Verse 7, 
And again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. <laughs> For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. This is what the Mosaic sabbatical law given. If the Sabbath of Moses was enough, then Joshua wouldn't have been referring to something greater coming. Again, the Sabbath shadowed Christ. For whoever has entered, in verse 10, God's rest has also rested from his works as God did. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Hold on, but I thought in this chapter he already said, we have entered his rest by faith. How come it's saying now let us strive to enter that rest? Well, it's another way of saying rest now and its fullness later. Sabbath now and Isaiah 66, Sabbath to Sabbath, later. Eternal life received, John 5, but its fullness at his return, Revelation 21 and 22. You see, the point is, is you have the glimpse of our eternal rest in Christ. And our meetings on the Lord's day are also but shadows as we strive into that rest. Actually, the rest of this chapter says individually strive and draw near to the throne of grace. So he's saying as we wait for that true rest, that full rest, strive to enter it by taking heed to the words and observe the words. And so that implies our day-to-day -day worship and even our Lord's day gatherings which are shadows of the substance in Christ to be revealed at his return. Does that make sense? And so no wonder why it's mentioned in Colossians 2 that the substance in it is in him. And so then that means that the New Testament practices of worship are not irrational, are not arbitrary, but they are purposed to shadow what is to come. So that means it must be kept must be honored because if we have received rest we maintain that rest we long for the fullness of that rest that's our attitude why do I love the Lord's day why do I love the Lord of the Sabbath because he has given me a rest to look forward and I have now hope that one day he will allow me to be even greater than what Adam and Eve experienced at the garden they will be with God and they will be with him forever. But I'm not done. Isaiah 58, again, the second promise. Are you still with me? Yes. I hope those minds are not drawing to uh, NFL or something. Look at the second promise in verse 14. Not only the delight in the Lord, you will have this uh, inexpressible fellowship with God, but you are promised what? And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah borrows from Deuteronomy 32 and 33. These are words that Moses tells his people because they're going to receive victory over their enemies. And just as Isaiah 33, a few chapters earlier, Isaiah promises his people that they will win. After exile, they will win. They will have the benefits of the land. They will receive the promises of their, of their God. But they knew when they were referring to the land or the necessities of promise, they knew that the Messiah was going to come at that point. That's why they're so angry at us. Because they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. Isaiah is referring to a temporal blessedness, but an internal blessing found in the substance which is in Christ. This is why Paul in Romans 8.37 says, We who are in Christ are more than conquerors. He takes that same principle of triumph of Isaiah 58 and he brings that into the New Testament church. And he says, we will triumph. Do you think that God is focused here 
on temporal winnings against their temporal enemies. He wasn't focused on that. He was focused of winning it all against their enemies. Death, hell, the grave, sin. And if you don't believe me, even further, uh, of Pastor, why should we apply this? Because the entirety of Isaiah 53, the section from Isaiah 53 all the way to 66 is reference to the messianic fulfillment of Christ and his coming. You already know Isaiah 53. We don't need to turn there, but Isaiah 53 speaks of his servanthood. Why would we apply that today if that's only for them? That's speaking of his coming. Uh, matter of fact, I will read to you from Isaiah 54. It's a promise of the spread of these people. The spread of the covenant of God's people will, will, will go throughout in the entire world. He says in, in verse 1 of 54, Sing, O barren one, who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of, her, of who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your offspring will possess the nations and will possess the desolate cities. Uh, look at that. It's saying the covenant people of God will extend, will go throughout the entire world. In Isaiah 55, there is a promise of a call for repentance, which is applied to the New Testament church. Just as Israel is a shadow, the substance in Christ is the church, including Israel, but with Gentiles. Isaiah 55, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my, stand, uh, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know, you shall run to, uh, you, shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your thoughts. Uh, uh, and, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In verse 10. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but the water, uh, water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes from out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led, in for, led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. What is it talking about? After you repent, after Gentiles and Jews come to repent, knowing and hearing the gospel in the, that's given even in the new covenant, it's pointing to Christ. The latter of Isaiah 55 is referring to that eternal rest. Whenever you see these great illustrations or descriptions of, these, of the water flowing and all of the mountains and the hills before you will break singing, this is all of creation that groans finally seeing its rest in Christ. So why shouldn't we take Isaiah 58? Because the entire section is speaking of the messianic fulfillment in Christ. And so Isaiah 58 should be taken as though it was a warning to Israel, but its fullness is fulfilled in the church. So then it's the observance of God, the profanity of the Sabbath. All of that affects the church. Isaiah 56, this is familiar to you. This is a promise to extend the Gentiles into the covenant. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for, my, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. 
Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold, my, hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Why is this important? So important. Because in the Old Testament law, the eunuch and the sojourner were not able to enjoy the, the beauties of the Lord's house. In Deuteronomy 23, the castrated man, the, the eunuch, wasn't allowed to experience the blessings of, his God, of, of the people of God. But all of a sudden, in Isaiah 56, these people who were once restricted also now have the privileges of the covenant people. When does that happen? In the New Testament, when God brings in the Gentiles and grafts them into the covenant people of God, and now they experience the house of the Lord, and they say, wow, this is what Paul says, you were alienated from the promises, but now you know, now you've enjoyed, you were once pagans, but now you've been brought into the family of God, adopted into his family. Verse 6, and the foreigners who, in, who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath, Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all my peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered glory so Isaiah 53 54 55 56 57 58 all the way to 66 speaks of Christ and the New Testament covenant people which includes Jews and Gentiles ah well that's why we're reading Isaiah 55 in application to us today isn't it because God calls his people to acknowledge the Lord of rest. Matter of fact, as we will learn in the next number of weeks, Jesus upholds the Sabbath, doesn't dismantle it, but he corrects the heart of the people when it comes to the Sabbath. Because he indeed is the Lord of the rest, much more shall we, or should we, Take heed to these words and not profane. But before we can get to days, honor not profaning your hearts, keeping them pure. Because before we can find joy in the Lord, we have to find joy. Or in the Lord's day, we must find joy in the Lord himself. And when we have joy in the Lord and his attributes and his works, and I urge you today when you go home, read the attributes of God and marvel at the beauties of your God and thank him that you are able to come and experience that rest. You see, and I'll close, I promise. Remember in Hebrews, it says, strive to enter that rest. Colossians 2 says that these are all shadows of the substance, which is Christ. Revelation 4 gives us a great image. Revelation 4 takes us to the throne room of God. And yes, although it speaks of 24 elders, it speaks of angels, the 24 elders there is a symbol, a symbol for the church gathered at the throne of God. And what are the 24 elders doing? Or the church, what are they saying at the throne of God as they, or we see the description there, singing? In verse 11, here's what they say. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. From creation, Romans 1, it has been evident, the hand of God in all things. The, whole, the majority, if not every psalm, speaks of the beauty of God, his attributes. But it's amazing that even in Revelation 4, at the worship of the saints, 
they are worshiping in accordance to the blessings of God at creation. And what are they saying? For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Ah, the intent of God for Adam and Eve in the beginning was to rest in their God and to see his beauty. And there, restored at glory, Revelation 4, at the throne room of God, where all his saints will be, they will be singing unto him, thanking him, for all things were created by him, even us, we sing worthy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. There are a lot of things that have been mentioned, which I pray your people have heard. Lord, with the struggle of sitting in for so long, I pray that you have given to them those right words out of the multitude of words that I've said to give them emphasis of how you view your day. But most importantly, as we dealt with today, the attitude that we should have, which is an attitude of delight, an attitude of honor, the attitude that seeks to be forgiven, an attitude that seeks to strive to enter into that rest. And Lord, not out of force nor compulsion we do, but out of the beauty and the glory of your hand, evident ever since creation. Father, may we give you glory for all of this. And only in that will we acknowledge what belongs to you from every day to this order of worship through the week on the Lord's day. Help us understand the right heart toward our Lord, who is the Lord of his day. Thank you, Father, we pray. Church of God said, amen. Could you stand to your feet, please?